Black Panther Wakanda Forever is right around the corner and we couldn't be more excited. There is a lot of speculation and theories surrounding who is going to be the actual villain of this film, since Namor has some complicated anti-hero storylines, but we also have the introduction of a Tuma to consider, and theories that Doctor Doom could be behind the major conflicts in this film. The introduction of new characters into the MCU is easily one of the most exciting parts of each new installment that comes out, and with that comes a lot of questions that we are anxious to have answered. Who is Namor? What about Atuma? Are they rivals? Is Wakanda Forever going to absolutely crush it in the box office? The answer to the latter may be obvious, but for the others, you'll need to continue watching if you want to learn more before these characters appear on the silver screen. Thankfully, the MCU is able to take creative liberties when it comes to a character's uniform, or in Namor's case, the lack thereof. In the comics, he was introduced in nothing but a green speedo, gold bracelets, and a special trident. The most interesting characteristic of Namor's appearance that is consistent between the comic books and the movie are his little ankle wings. They may be tiny and placed in an unusual location, but they are able to grant him the ability to fly through the air, which, let's face it, if we needed tiny ankle wings to fly, we would definitely flaunt them. People used to wear ankle bracelets for crying out loud, and there was no benefit to that. So now that we have a visual for Namor, let's take a dive into some of his backstory. As previously mentioned, Namor, aka the Submariner, has a complicated history where some story arcs portray him as a villain, while others he can be the hero, and sometimes both within the same arc. This complexity is due to the fact that he fights for Atlantis, that which he is king of, and no one else. Sometimes when he fights for Atlantis, it really means he is fighting for himself, but at that point we are just arguing semantics, so let's just agree that he walks the very fine line of hero and villain pretty often. There are two sides to every coin, and on this side we have the first display of Namor living the hero life while fighting alongside the other beloved heroes after World War II when he becomes part of the All Winners squad with Captain America. The All Winners squad conducted one of their first missions in 1946, where they thwarted a villain named Ispiza's plan to steal an atomic bomb. He tried to trick our squad of heroes by planning a bunch of other crimes based on the different ages of men. However, the All Winners squad, led by Torch, were able to figure out the real plan and put a stop to it. This is also the first time Namor's name was thrown under the bus, as Ispiza planted false information that made it seem like Namor was working with him. While that didn't disband the group, they did only last until about 1950. Namor has also teamed up with the Avengers on several occasions, and has even earned their respect for some of his acts. They recognize that he has some tremendous powers as King of Atlantis, and I'm sure more times than not, they really wish he would just pick a side already. One of the Submariner's biggest claims to Avengers fame is when he discovered the underwater cocoon that contained Jean Grey, who everyone thought was dead. The Phoenix Force had actually created a body double of Jean Grey, and believed itself to be the real Jean. In order for this delusional Phoenix Force to wreak all sorts of havoc on the world, the real Jean Grey had to be dealt with. You can't claim to be someone else when there are two of you walking around now, can you? So, a cocoon was concocted and the real Jean Grey was safely placed inside of it, until Namor stumbled upon it at the depths of the ocean. Namor was a little more successful at being part of the Defenders than he was at being an Avenger. The Defenders don't have as tight of an initiation as the Avengers, and require less of a commitment to be considered part of the group, which is exactly what the Submariner is looking for. More of a group with benefits, and less of a long-term relationship. Doctor Strange, Silver Surfer, and the Hulk are some of the more regular members of the Defenders. And, aside from Doctor Strange, Namor tends to have conflicting personalities with the other members. They have been able to set aside their differences, however, in order to defend against some pretty powerful beings. For example, the four aforementioned heroes joined together to defeat Shanzar, who is the Sorcerer Supreme of the Strange Matter Dimension, as he was trying to resurrect an Elder God known as the Wild One. Shanzar unfortunately succeeded in this endeavor, but the Defenders were able to trap the Wild One in the Strange Matter Dimension, which forced Shanzar to admit defeat. 
At one point, the defenders that we have mentioned so far were cursed by Yandroth, who, for those who don't know, is an alien scientist that learned they could possess great power by destroying worlds and went up against the defenders a few times. Yandroth's curse was that any time catastrophe struck the planet, the defenders would automatically be united. The motivation behind this was that Yandroth's spirit would feed off the energy created by the defenders, in hopes that he would be reborn more powerful than ever. That feels very horcruxy to me, but eventually that curse was broken. Now it's time to explore the other end of the good vs evil, hero vs villain side of the metaphorical coin I had mentioned previously. The Submariner is considered a mutant for all intents and purposes, so when the X-Men all team up for a common cause, he is usually on their side. Such is the case whenever the X-Men are opposing the Avengers, like when the Phoenix Force is coming toward Earth. The Avengers wanted to destroy the Phoenix Force, while the X-Men wanted to harness its power. Namor sided with the X-Men, and when Iron Man attempted to destroy the Phoenix, it split into five and chose five individuals to merge with, thus granting Namor significantly amplified abilities and the Phoenix Five was formed. That sounds like an 80s cover band, don't you think? Namor went on a straight up power trip and invaded Wakanda, but was eventually taken down by the Black Panther and the Avengers. In other story arcs, Namor has offered Atlantis as a base of operations for other mutants while they tried to create a nation of solely mutants. The Submariner has a tendency to be an extremist and doesn't really believe in half measures when it comes to protecting himself, the ocean, and the population of Atlantis. Almost any time anything bad happened to Atlantis, Namor would blame the surface world and would take action against them. In one such instance, after a dark celestial invasion on his home, he sent his warriors to board a Roxxon whaling ship and he took gunmen as prisoners with plans to execute them. Since Namor has helped the Avengers in the past, they tried to negotiate with him at first, but ended up coming to blows with one another. It wasn't until Captain America convinced him to hand over the men that he planned to execute that he finally did, but that wasn't enough for Namor. Once the gunmen were placed in a prison, the Submariner flooded the prison block with water from the toilets. This ultimately led to the formation of the Defenders of the Deep, since Namor came to the conclusion that only he can protect the seas in a way that he sees fit. Depending on who you agree with, you might actually view Namor as the hero when he battles against the Avengers. But since Earth's mightiest heroes are often seen as the good guys, it's hard to argue why a good person would get in their way. Magneto is another character that has had a combination of straight up villain arcs, but with little sprinkles of morally gray arcs as well. That makes Namor and Magneto an obvious pairing. During one of Magneto's attempts at global domination, Namor can be seen aiding this cause as well. This is a special arc for Namor, because we witness him go from being the villain to more of a good guy within the same story. The Submariner becomes upset during X-Men number 6 at Magneto's treatment of the Scarlet Witch and tries to turn his back on Magneto and his plans. He probably would have just gone back to Atlantis, but Magneto felt the need to attack Namor, which ultimately led to the destruction of a giant magnet that Magneto was utilizing, thus foiling his plans of global domination. At this point, I'm not sure we can fully call anything Namor has done a good thing, but we can at least give him kudos for having some sort of moral compass. Namor has a funny way of asking for help sometimes, and it can result in fighting the very person whose help he needs. Take Submariner number 34 for example, when Namor discovers a machine that can control the Earth's weather. Instead of using this machine for his own agenda, he tries to enlist the Silver Surfer to help him destroy it by subtly dragging him into the ocean. No one appreciates being dragged anywhere, so the two of them duke it out to a near standstill where Namor finally convinces the Silver Surfer to join his plan. All he probably had to do was say please and it would have saved a lot of fighting. But that's not the only time Namor has fought with former allies one on one. At one point, Bruce Banner was found unconscious by Lady Dorma and was brought back to Atlantis. Banner witnesses an altercation between Namor and Dorma, which causes him to go Hulk out and fight the Submariner. Despite being allies to one another since the 60s, Namor is forced to punch the Hulk so hard that he flies out of the water, and when he finally lands, he transforms back into Bruce Banner. 
It's pretty difficult to punch the Hulk out of his Hulk form, since that normally would just enrage him even more, but Namor was able to do it. He has even taken out the Red Hulk underwater after he teams up with him to stop a plan to vaporize the world's oceans in Hulk Volume 2, Number 27. Namor likes to jump to conclusions, and the same holds true in this storyline, since after he was attacked by sea monsters, he assumes he was betrayed by the Red Hulk. He is quickly ejected from the sea and back onto the surface. Namor can flip faster than a light switch if he feels he is being betrayed or that his people are in danger, and once he has made up his mind, it can be pretty difficult to convince him to see reason. However, when he isn't fighting against people that he has joined forces with before, he does have an overarching nemesis that we can see time and time again. For the purposes of the upcoming Black Panther film, we have to discuss another character that is pivotal to fully understanding Namor. Atuma is a warlord that believes in a prophecy that states he is the true ruler of Atlantis, and he tries, time and time again, to make it so. Sometimes Atuma is successful in his endeavor, but it is typically short-lived. There have been times that teams like the Fantastic Four have had to help Namor regain control of Atlantis, simply because they understood that Namor is the lesser of two evils. One of Atuma's coolest storylines is when he discovers one of the Seven Hammers of the Worthy, enchanted by the Serpent and becomes the Breaker of Oceans. He gains enhanced mystical power from the hammer, and summons a massive tidal wave on Vancouver. That is some catastrophic stuff right there. One of the main reasons the Submariner doesn't like to interact with the surface world is because it seems like every time he spends a significant amount of time away from Atlantis, he loses control of his throne and it is usually at the hands of Atuma. Atuma is relentless in his pursuit of Atlantis, which begs the question whether or not Atuma is going to be our villain in the Wakanda Forever movie. Considered to be a super being among his race, he has a ton of strength and capabilities that will make him a formidable foe. He can breathe in and out of water, has acute senses, and has superhuman strength, speed, and stamina. We have more questions than answers when it comes to the role of Atuma in Wakanda Forever, like whether or not he is the villain of the story, or is just a red herring distracting us from the introduction of an overarching Thanos-level villain. Let's say someone like Doctor Doom? Wakanda Forever is capping off Phase 4 of the MCU, and you can't end a phase without a bang or something to pull at our nerd strings. The rumors circulating around Doctor Doom are expansive, since he is a major player throughout Marvel Comics. He is often seen battling with the Fantastic Four, so there is ground to stand on that he has to appear eventually, since he is heavily connected with them and plays a major role in the Secret Wars event. There is anticipation that we will see Doctor Doom in some sort of post credit scene like we did with Thanos at the end of Phase 1. If he shows up now, it will indicate to all of us just how major of a player he is going to be throughout the rest of Phases 5 and 6. We could even see Doom and Kang battle it out in Secret Wars. Perhaps Namor and Atuma are manipulated into going to battle against Wakanda, so Doom can steal the Vibranium to make himself even more powerful which would be similar in style to the Doom War series. This theory is backed up by the most recent Black Panther trailer. During the trailer, you see soldiers storm an ocean research base that appears to be Wakandian in nature. The infiltrating soldiers wear no identifying marks, so it would be easy to misconstrue who they are working for, and would make it even easier to frame somebody else, thus warranting a retaliation and therefore starting out an all-out war. While two kingdoms are distracted with one another, it can be easy peasy to waltz into one of them and steal something like, I don't know, vibranium? When you house the most powerful material in the world, it is going to cause the wrong people to come knocking on your door from time to time. And what better time to do that than during the loss of their great leader? Bad guys don't offer time off to mourn. Namor the Submariner has been a wild card for Marvel since the beginning, and they utilized that aspect of him to his fullest potential time and time again. The actor portraying Namor in Wakanda Forever, Tenoch Huerta, has said in interviews that Namor is an anti-hero and not a villain. It will be very interesting to see what that means, and if we will get to see Namor flip a switch from good to bad, or vice versa, on the big screen. A character with this level of unpredictability will be very exciting to have as part of the MCU for the long haul, and we hope that turns out to be the case. What are your thoughts on Namor the Submariner? Let us know in the comments, and thank you for watching.